All right. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Weekly. I work at Policy Scotland at the University of Glasgow, and um, we're very excited to have you here today. We're doing this webinar um, in collaboration with the Third Sector Research Forum, and you probably already know why you're here, but um, today we're going to be um, sharing the work of four folks who have um, innovated in their research and evaluation in 2020. Um, and uh, we're going to hear from them first, and then we're going to have time for you all to go into some breakout groups, um, which is a very informal chat um, about um, your experiences as well. So let's go to our next slide to get you a full rundown of what we're going to do for the next little while. Introduction by me which won't take too much longer. The first folks we're gonna hear from are Amy Calder from YouthLink Scotland and Kelly McInnes from Northern Star. They worked together on a project uh, in 2020. Um, then we're gonna hear from Jane Collingworth from the University of Glasgow, uh, Chris Ross from Children in Scotland. You all a small break. Um, and then we're gonna come back for one more presentation from Ruth McKenna at Waverly Care and then to our breakout groups. Um, I've left uh, 15 minutes at the end for a panel discussion with presenters if we have time. However, I'm also using that as a nice buffer just to, to make sure that, that we are out of here um, by 2.30 because um, I know how things are when we uh, when, when, when um, webinars go over. So I, I wanna make sure we stay tight to time. So without further ado, um, let's go on to the next slide and I will just hand it right over to Amy and Kelly. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks for the invite for today. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, I'm Amy Calder and I'm the Senior Policy and Research Officer at YouthLink Scotland. And I'm also a member of the Third Sector Research Forum. And so today, together with Kelly McInnes, who's the Director of Northern Star, we're going to be talking to you about a study that we conducted um, and completed during the first lockdown um, back in March of last year. Um, with LGBT Youth Scotland, um, where we were examining the impact of LGBT Youth Scotland's digital youth work on young people. So I'm going to start by just giving you a little bit of background um, and a brief overview of the methodology and how we adapted it. And then Kelly will discuss some reflections on the process. So Linda, if you won't mind going to the next slide, thank you. So during, during 2019 and 2020, YouthLink Scotland, um, Northern Star and the University of Edinburgh worked together to use an exciting and participatory research methodology, which is called transformative evaluation. And this is to explore um, the impact of community-based universal youth work. And we use this in Dumfries and Galloway um, and again in Edinburgh with the voluntary sector. So what we mean just very quick, quickly about universal youth work is that it's youth work that's open to all young people and its purpose is not predetermined um, or aimed at addressing any specific issues or problems. It really is open to any young person who wants to attend. And so those were the studies that came before and the methodology has been developed by Dr. Sue Cooper from the University of St. Mark and St. John. And we initially used it in a national study in Scotland and it involves training youth workers to collect stories stories of impact and we call these significant change stories and they collect those from young people who've engaged with their service in person over time and the collection of the story is based on a reflective conversation between the young person and their youth worker. So transformative evaluation is consistent with the values and approach of youth work um, because it provides that opportunity to listen to the stories of young people about what they think they've gained from taking part in youth work. So when lockdown began and youth work was moved online, we felt that there was an opportunity to adapt the methodology to an online setting. So we took the view that this could be extremely helpful in providing youth workers with an opportunity to have reflective conversations with young people about the impact of digital youth work during lockdown. And so that's why we worked in partnership with LGBT Youth Scotland for this study. And what we asked of the youth workers was to have that reflective conversation with a young person and to focus on one question. And that question was, during lockdown, what do you think has been the most significant change that occurred for you as a result of engaging with us online? So the stories were then recorded and they were enriched by including commentary from the youth workers um, who were helping to contextualize the story of the young person. So to give a little bit more information about the life of that young person and the impact that youth work had had on their lives, 
and it created what we call a co-authored significant change story. If you can move to the next slide, please, Linda. Perfect. And so, sorry, Linda, if you could move to the next slide, that'd be perfect. Thank you so much, thank you. So before COVID-19, um, myself and Kelly have been involved in conducting the two studies I just mentioned in Dumfries and Galloway in Edinburgh, and both were delivered in person. So for this study, we decided we'd follow the same process and the same methodology, but we moved it online. So this included um, that I provided training to the youth workers using Zoom, um, and that was training on the methodology, how to have reflective conversations with young people in the process of collecting those significant change stories. And the youth workers then collected the stories with young people online and they used Teams or Facebook Messenger. So they went away after the training and collected those stories. We then worked with a small group of youth workers to code the stories. And again, we did this on Zoom. And this is what we call using collective participative coding. And it's a process of supporting the youth workers to draw out those key themes that emerge from the stories and assign codes, which it is distinguishing between the impact and the process. So the impacts on the young people have been in, being involved in digital youth work. And then how did youth work contribute to that impact through the process? So examples of some of the impact codes that came out were um, reduced isolation and improved well-being. So from the stories that were told, that's, those were two of the main key codes. And an example of process included creating safe spaces um, and opportunities for group work. So those are two main um, codes as well. So Kelly um, is an independent researcher. And so she then analyzed that data um, based on the youth workers coding. And then she wrote the report. And our, then our use of the methodology and the final report were then verified by the University of Edinburgh. I'll pop um, a link in the chat to um, a copy of our report so you can see what it is that our key findings, but Kelly's now going to reflect on some of the successes and challenges of this adaption to the methodology online. Thanks Amy and, uh, and thanks for having us this afternoon. Um, I guess I want to start with um, when we went into lockdown and decided to, to kind of run with this study we planned the research in a period of, of flux, as I'm sure you, you all remember, when we went into lockdown, things were changing quickly and rapidly. Um, and I think now that the study is finished and Amy and I have had time to think and reflect on the process, there are some things that, that worked really well that we would keep that, that, that were great and other things that we would change and, and do differently. And I just wanted to share a little bit of that thinking with you this afternoon. Um, in terms of, of data collection, the stories that uh, we gathered from the young people tended to be shorter um, than stories that we'd had in offline studies. Um, I'm not entirely sure why this was. We think it's because when it's face to face, it's a, it's, it's a very interactive conversation. I think when it's online, uh, even if it's you know one-on-one -on -one conversation between a youth worker and a young person, it's still quite challenging to have that interactive um, conversation. It tends to be a little bit more stilted. And some of the stories the young people wrote themselves and, and kind of sent into their, to their youth workers. So I think we had, we had shorter stories and less depth than we had in, in some of the others. And I think our youth workers also find it quite challenging to gather stories to be able to get hold of young people they weren't physically in the same space um, and we gathered fewer stories than we aimed to so we were looking for around 30 and gathered um, just over 20 stories um, so I think that that was quite a challenge for us I think what was also quite challenging for the young people was thinking about what was impact that had resulted from digital youth work in lockdown and being able to separate that from impact that had happened pre-lockdown. Um, and I think that that was, was a running theme through the research. And I think we don't, you know, I think the fact that they had these existing relationships was really important and actually helped deliver the impact that we saw in, in lockdown. In terms of the coding, this was much more challenging online. As Amy said, it was a, a, a deliberately participative process. Um, and this is much harder to deliver in, in a digital space. Um, you're less able to have free flowing discussions. 
um, the conversation is more stilted. And actually the reflective silences that we often saw in the coding days were much more difficult to interpret um, because it's, it's much harder to read body language. Everybody's not, you know, not everybody's looking at the same flip chart as you would be doing in, in um, when you're in, when you're face to face. The video conferencing is much more tiring, um, and I think that we were able to code less stories uh, on the day. Um, we used a tool called Padlet, which is an online list making tool is probably the best way of describing it that worked brilliantly and we would use that again uh, and we used that to keep a record of the codes and um, everybody had access to it it was updated in real time um, it's it worked really really well for us um, and I guess a kind of overall sort of thinking about about the data coding is that I think we try to replicate the offline coding day online and actually in future we would possibly rethink the whole coding process um, so that it's better suited to an online environment. Um, Linda, if you could please move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, the other kind of key thing that Amy and I have reflected on quite a lot is researcher well-being. Um, in the study, we thought a lot about participant well-being. Uh, we were really aware that young people were potentially isolated, um, and that the that you know sharing their story might be difficult. Um, we didn't think as much, I think, about about researcher well-being, and our and our youth workers were beginner researchers. Um, both Amy and I, in this study and in other studies that we've worked on in lockdown kind of realised that researching online in a pandemic is, is can be quite a lonely experience and in future we would put more emphasis on researcher well-being and support um, in any studies particularly online um, because there isn't that informal face-to-face -face support that you would often get from colleagues. I think I'd better stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Amy and Kelly. Um, again, Amy's helpfully put um, the link to that full report in the chat function if you want to um, take a look at that um, when you have a chance. Um, the next person we're going to hear from is uh, my colleague at the University of Glasgow, Jane Cullingworth. So, uh, Linda, we can go to her slides and I'll, uh, it's off to Jane. Jane, we can't, Jane, we can't hear you. It might have something to do with your earphones. All right, okay. No, we still can't hear you. I'm sorry, we still can't hear you. What we can do is um, we'll just flick forward to uh, Chris first. So if we could just go, um, Linda, to, to Chris's slides, and then we'll hopefully grab Linda, uh, we'll grab um, Jane in a bit. So uh, Linda, if you want to go ahead and yeah. share your screen. Okay, I'll just do that. I'll just flick okay. forward. And to... Just go forward to Chris's slides. That would be great. That's right, right. Okay, and I'll share screen. Now. Chris, we're, we're pushing you up the schedule. Right. Who doesn't? Who needs? Who needs a bit of excitement just now? I guess. So, uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, perfect. Great. Thanks, Linda. Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Ross. I'm a senior policy of project and participation officer at uh, Children in Scotland. I've been asked just to talk a little bit, similar, I guess, to Amy and Kelly, just about adapting approaches to peer research and evaluation during the pandemic. And so I'm going to take a kind of case study approach to that and look at a, a peer research project that we delivered prior to coronavirus, and then also reflect on some of the, the challenges of delivering a peer evaluation project during the current context. Linda, if you could move on to the next slide, please. So yeah, so Children in Scotland's approach to participation and engagement, we want all of our work as an organisation to be to be as led as far as possible 
by children and young people. It's underpinned by Article 12 of the, the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child. And the, we've got guidelines for that participation and engagement of children and young people that I've included a link for in the slides, which I'm sure will be, sure will be shared round. Our aim as, a, as an organisation is for, yeah, as I said, as much of our work to be to be led by young people as possible. So that goes from having children and young people involved in our internal governance. So be that through an advisory group of young people with young people on our board of trustees, but also within the projects that we deliver. Um, and increasingly we're seeing peer research, I guess, as an approach that's really valuable for that because it allows children and young people to take on a lead role within the design and the development of the project, but also within the analysis stages of that as well. Uh, Linda, if you could move me on to the next slide, please. So I'm going to have to give a fairly whistle-stop tour to the two projects that I'm covering because of the, the time that we've got today. But the project that I'm looking at prior to the pandemic is our, was a peer research project that I was involved in delivering. So it was looking at exploring the, the role of communities on health inequalities from the perspective of children and young people. Now, the main aspect of the delivery of the project finished up in March 2020. So literally as the pandemic was hitting, we were trying to conduct the evaluation of the project and ended up unfortunately missing out on some aspects of that. We worked with 15 young peer researchers in a split across a primary school in Glasgow and a secondary school in Dundee. And their role, as I said, was involved. They decided on the research methods that we used. They decided on the topics that they wanted to cover within that broad theme of the role of where they lived on health and well-being, the impact of the role of where they lived on health and well-being and inequality. And so they, and then they were involved in the analysis of the project. So they decided that they wanted to focus on topics like safety, littering and family and friends and how those impacted on their health and well-being in the places that they lived. And they chose to take a, a sort of a mixed methods approach. We'd chosen to do some photography based work because we knew that would be a helpful way of involving them in the in the research, but they also decided they wanted to do some focus groups with, with their peers within their school setting as well. Uh, Linda, if you could move me on to the next slide, please. Um, so I'm not going to be able to go into the detail of the findings, but I've included the, the link to the, the project report and an animation we had made at the end of my slide. So I think, again, those will be shared around. I'm more going to look at sort of why the project worked. And I mean, you just have to take my word for it that it did. So, um, so that's kind of, but uh, we, we were really pleased with it, with the outcomes of the project, with the nuance of the findings and the, the children and young people's analysis of that. And I think the reasons that I think that worked, some of that was down to practical factors. We worked with the children and young people for, for 12 months. I think I worked with both sets of children 14 times, maybe across the two different schools. So it was quite, a, quite an intensive process. That meant we were really able to focus on building meaningful relationships with the children to engage them in the project, to make sure they were comfortable sharing their views. But also similar, I think, to Amy and uh, Kelly were saying about youth workers, they were taking on a role as a researcher for the first time. And so we were able to put a lot of time into to building their skills and knowledge and understanding of both of the topics, but also of understanding research methods and how to understand them in the abstract sense, but also how to deliver them with, with their peers. And the fact we were working face to face meant we could deliver whole day sessions with them as we would normally. And I'll touch a bit more and I think of why that's relevant in terms of the challenges of delivering it in the pandemic. Um, then just parts of the approach that we used, all of our work is kind of tends to be fun and activity based. We try to build games into everything. So, for example, in developing analytical skills, we were doing stuff like mix and match games with them at the very start of the project so that they were able to think about sorting things into themes. And we were able to bring that through as a as a kind of train to to support them with a yeah, to, to support them with sorting things into themes at the analysis of the project. We were also able to have in that length of time, we could focus on things like going out for dinner and doing activities. So building those relationships with the children and young people, which supported their involvement, but also for some of the young people we were working with probably hadn't been involved in projects that lasted that length of time and were that focused. And so it allowed them to, it supported us to retain their engagement in a slightly more transactional sense, I guess. And lastly, using that relationships based approach, we were able to make adjustments to the pace of the project based on their needs, or we were able to make adjustments on the day if things weren't working out exactly as we expected. We knew and we could kind of read things based off of the off of the young researchers body language, again, which is kind of in contrast to what Kelly was saying about working online. If you could take me on to the next slide, Linda. And then I think the method itself actually using a peer a peer research approach really worked for the type of project we were trying to do. 
having children deliver focus groups with other children that they worked with totally changed those power dynamics. I think it led to, to a very different set of discussions than had I been leading those, for example, um, and I think led to very different outcomes from those. Using use, Being able to use sort of photography and actually go out and explore the community was a really important way of engaging them in the process. We were exploring an area that they knew and they could kind of lead us round, but they also, we were able to document that and it allowed us to kind of stop and capture different moments throughout the research. But also when we were analysing things, it gave them a reference point to refer back to, um, I think. And that was really, really helpful in terms of when we were talking about stuff that we'd done maybe a month or two previously, it gave a point that they could actually go, oh, we did that, we spoke about that in that place. Um, and also, they said it was more fun. I think when I was doing some of the evaluations, some of them said I had never quite realised the research would be could be that fun. And so bringing in some of those more artistic based things helped again, just retain some of that engagement. And then it also all of that gave us sort of yeah, it gave us some tactile resources to actually work through in person. Again, I think Kelly, you mentioned about having flip chart paper that you could all work from. And that was kind of how we worked. We had the focus group data and the photos and we worked through both of those and it was something to refer to. And that's obviously, again, something I'll touch on a bit in terms of how we're working at the moment. And then lastly, in a slightly different sense, but we were able to include the young people in the launch event for the project. They co-designed the launch event that we held at Tyne Castle Stadium. They were able to present on their findings. They were able to talk about, tell me what different things they wanted to make that feel like a comfortable and safe space to work in. And they were able to then run, they then ran table discussions with professionals, with MSPs and with different stakeholders. I personally am finding that a lot harder to do in a remote environment to involve children and young people within within this space, for example, I would have not maybe felt quite so comfortable to do. Uh, so, Linda, if you could take me on to the next slide, please. So what has changed, I guess, during the pandemic? Well, all of our work since March has now been online. We've not delivered any any face to face delivery with children and young people. Uh, and that's presented a range of, sort of practical concerns and challenges, sort of more basic ones. Firstly, we did all our work on like on, in face to face before the pandemic. And so just getting set up for actually having the resources to deliver online was was difficult. And that presented things like, as I'm sure many people had the conversation about whether Zoom was an appropriate space to be working with children and young people on, for example, and set lots of discussions about safeguarding. Then similar discussions to have been in the news about getting people digital access and whether people could access computers and laptops or whether they had the data. And I'm sure many people found it's not as simple as just offering those to people in terms of actually getting getting them to take, take that up has proven difficult at times. And then there's adapting our own practice. A lot of our methods, the methods that I wanted to use, for example, using photography has not been quite so viable. So how do we change that to, to work in the online environment? But to some extent, we're not doing anything different. My colleague Emma wrote, uh, had a blog at the start of the pandemic saying, we're using the same principles, it's just within a different context. And I think that's really been really important. Linda, if you could take it on to the next slide, please. So the so the, the project I wanted to focus on for, the, for how we've been working during the pandemic is our evaluation of Life Changes Trust's Home and Belonging Initiative. So that's a peer evaluation project working with three care experienced young people to evaluate 12 projects that are supporting young people with experience of care into their first home. The original plan for it had been, had been written prior to the pandemic and had involved us going out to all the 12 sites and actually getting to interact with everybody. Obviously that hasn't been, hasn't been possible within the current context. Again, Linda, if you could take me on to the next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Um, and so I thought I was actually I was just going to focus on some of the challenges that there have been of using a peer evaluation approach within the current context, kind of reflecting on the opposite from what worked about delivering face to face. In part, coronavirus has obviously affected the projects that we're trying to evaluate, trying to get time and space from them has been really, really difficult. But also it's slowed down our work. There have been bigger gaps in our, our work with the peer evaluators. And so how do we retain engagement from them? across those gaps, but also how do we embed the, the research skills that we took a lot of time to embed in, in the health inequalities project. So there's been a lot of repetition of work, which obviously has a knock on effect to what, what else we were able to deliver. Similar to Kelly, I think I was reflecting on the fact that it was interesting you brought this up, Kelly, that the impact on, on the youth workers and on the young people we were working with, there was much more pastoral support required than I would have anticipated when setting up the project. And 
then also we've also moved to much shorter sessions. We're trying to deliver hour and a half long Zoom sessions when previously we would have been delivering those whole day face-to-face -face, um, face -face activities. In terms of the data collection, we've obviously not been able to do that face-to-face. -face. I would have liked to have gone out to the project. We would have conducted interviews with people, but we would have also been taking notes on flip chart paper. We would have had all those physical resources. Instead, we've been getting sort of a long interview transcripts, and it's been quite hard to work out how to turn those into more accessible things for, for young people. And I'll touch upon that in, in the challenges of the analysis. Also, there was a gap there around actually meeting the different projects and the young people getting to learn from from the experience just getting to learn a little bit about the projects just by informally chatting to people at the start of the day and it was much harder to build that in when working remotely and next slide please linda so as i said well a big challenge has been basically has been around our analysis of the project as i said the transcriptions for the interviews were really long and are not really in a version in a, in a form that 16 17 year olds were going to particularly want to engage with or be be viable for them to engage with so there was a lot of time taken to turn those into more accessible more that turn that into more accessible data but also but without changing it in any way and without putting our slant on it so that they were still leading on that analysis and that took up a lot of time but even what what i got it to i was comfortable with what i was sending them but it's not the ideal way i would have wanted to work it wasn't as enjoyable for them to work through i don't think it certainly wasn't as creative a way of doing things but also not having access to those kind of the tactile resources again to work through together similar to what you were saying kelly i think made that analysis process a lot harder and also we we did adapt our time limits we worked our time of timings of our sessions we worked for much shorter sessions but then you're much more reliant on people doing the work in between and again everybody had other things going on in their lives and trying to get trying to always get that work completed was incredibly challenging so we had to adapt our work a lot we had to be very flexible and try and make time and space for the evaluation panel we were offering different times for them to be involved we were but also not pushing too hard because again accepting that they've got lots of other stuff going on so i think it was just about trying to meet people where they're at and i'm really comfortable with what our, we've just finished our year one report and I've included a summary, a link to the summary report at the end of the presentation, but there was a lot of challenges to get it to that point. And so, yeah, Linda, if you could take us on to the next slide, please. So, yeah, I think just some lessons and learning from across the year. For me, the same principles still apply to what we were doing already. When you're working remotely, you do the same things as working face to face, but everything takes more time. There's going to be adaptations and that will have a knock-on effect to what we were trying to do. I think I've certainly found it's easier to deliver the projects with less sort of less deep participation, if you like. It's easy to go and gather views from children and young people, slightly harder to involve them in the analysis of, of findings and to keep them engaged for longer periods of time. As a wholly unartistic person, being creative in an artistic sense is, is much more challenging for me working remotely. It's harder to bring that in it's still really important though to make space for the i guess those fun the fun and the enjoyment and the team building if we're asking people to take part in these evaluation projects for quite an extended period of time then we need to support that involvement and it's really important not to not to lose the fun and the enjoyment because it will support better a better project and better outcomes and i think the last bit that's been really key and i'm sure has been for everybody is just being flexible in the approach and working as i said working from where people are and meeting them at a place where they are able to contribute by accepting maybe that that might have some limitations. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much for all that information. And um, just to let everybody know, there's um, lots of links on all of these slides. So what I'm gonna do is um, we'll be able to make these slides available with the recording as well. Um, what we're gonna do next is um, just progress the slides, Linda, and uh, Ruth McKenna is gonna um, chat with us. So uh, yes, I will uh, hand it off to Ruth. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Ruth McKenna, and I'm the Senior Research and Communications Manager at Waverly Care. Um, could I have the first slide, please, Linda? Um, so just to give a bit of background to Waverly Care, if people haven't come across us before, um, so we're a, nat a national HIV, hepatitis C and sexual health charity. Um, we deliver a range of services, mostly kind of statutory funded services. 
um, around sort of HIV, hepatitis C and sexual health prevention. So that's things like kind of condom distribution, um, distributing safer injecting equipment. Um, we deliver HIV and hepatitis C outreach testing um, at various kind of community-based venues. We provide support for people living with HIV um, and or hepatitis C who are going through their treatment. And, and just to kind of flag that we sort of primarily work with communities that are disproportionately affected by these conditions. So in terms of HIV in the UK, that's primarily gay bisexual men and men who have sex with men, um, people from sub-Saharan African communities and people who inject drugs. And in terms of hepatitis C, it's um, almost exclusively uh, people who inject drugs. We have a kind of stream of research and engagement work that's funded by the Scottish Government. Um, and again, that's kind of about engaging with communities that are currently sort of underrepresented in uh, research around bloodborne viruses and sexual health. Um, so uh, kind of in the existing HIV literature, that's primarily people from African communities and, and people who inject drugs, as well as sort of other communities that might face barriers to engaging with sexual health services. So, um, for example, we've recently just completed a big piece of research looking at the experiences of trans people accessing sexual health services in Scotland. We tend to have a peer-led approach embedded in our work, so when we're carrying out research on a particular issue, we'll generally work with people who have personal experience of that issue, um, we'll join the team as paid staff, and we'll kind of work together to, to investigate whatever the particular topic is that we're, we're looking at. Um, so in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm just going to share briefly some learning from two different pieces of evaluation work that we've completed um, during 2020, both very different projects and I suppose were affected by um, the COVID pandemic in, in quite different ways, um, and then just share some learning, I suppose, from, from both at the end. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so the first service I'm just going to talk about is an evaluation of our HIV street service. So this was a service that was developed in response to an, an HIV outbreak that's ongoing among people who inject drugs in Glasgow and actually some kind of surrounding health board areas. The service provides kind of street-based outreach, so um, things like providing injecting equipment, advice about safer injecting, um, providing HIV testing and, and supporting people that are either at higher risk of contracting HIV um, or have already been diagnosed with HIV uh, through the, this kind of outbreak that's ongoing. And we planned a peer-led evaluation of the service, um, which was due to begin the sort of week commencing the 16th of March 2020. So that obviously went completely uh, down the pan and we had to, to sort of re-coordinate um, re what we were going to do. So in the previous six months, sort of prior to March 2020, we'd been working with a group of peer researchers um, who themselves had had kind of personal experience of drug use and recovery. Um, we'd sort of gone through recruitment, extensive training, um, and we're sort of good to go with a, a research plan or an evaluation plan that involved face-to-face -face interviewing and um, working with our frontline staff in the street team. So when the lockdown came into force, we essentially initially just postponed the evaluation. Um, I think naively, like a lot of people, we thought we'd sort of be in lockdown for a period and then things would snap back to normal and we'd be able to resume the work kind of exactly as, as we'd originally planned. Um, Obviously, when it became clear that wasn't going to be possible, we took steps to redesign the project as a, as a kind of remote evaluation, basically based around the, the peer researchers carrying out phone interviews with people who use the street service. Um, because one of the real challenges we had is that the people we're trying to reach through the evaluation were um, either homeless or moving in and out of temporary accommodation, didn't always have access to a phone, let alone a device. So there were real really significant challenges in, in trying to do anything that was sort of based around using um, Zoom or, or I suppose any of the methods that might work um, in different projects. So um, into kind of autumn winter, our, our frontline staff in the street service team were able to resume some face-to-face -face work. Um, and so we basically came up with a, a kind of quite logistically complicated plan whereby the street workers would invite people to take part in a phone interview. And then if the person wanted to do that and, and once kind of had time to, to um, read information about the evaluation, they could either do that where they were outside um, or use a space in a partner organisation in the city centre. So there were loads of challenges to kind of overcome um, and it really took us, it, it took us until December to be in a position to be able to deliver the project um, for something that was actually ready to go in, in kind of March 2020. So it took a real time investment to get to the point where we could actually deliver the project and um, really just using telephone interviewing. One of the key challenges, um, I think, is, is kind of 
come up in the previous presentation is around just training for, for the peer researchers and sort of the needs of um, redesigning training that's been based on delivering face-to-face -face research and perhaps doing face-to-face -face interviews and then trying to sort of upskill people in using telephone interviewing or remote interviewing approaches which is obviously a completely different method um, with its own set of challenges. We had lots of ethical sort of challenges to address with things like how we would get the consent forms to people, how we would get information sheets to people. Um, because obviously if we'd been doing face-to-face -face interviewing, the plan would be that the peer researcher would just do that there and then as part of the interview. Um, but essentially what we ended up doing is that the frontline staff who were actually in contact with the person kind of did the consent form with them, went through the information sheet um, and, and sort of how we got around that issue, given that the peer researcher and, and the participant were, were only speaking on the phone. Um, we essentially decided that from a kind of safety point of view, nobody should come into face-to-face -face contact if that wouldn't have been the case anyway. So um, because the frontline staff were already engaging with people on, on the street, um, we kind of felt it was okay to have that additional interaction around evaluation, um, but not to have the peer researchers sort of doing any face-to-face -face work solely for the purpose of evaluation, um, just obviously because of the risk to them and, and also the people that we work with. Um, ensuring everyone had access to a phone was, was one of the real logistical challenges. Um, again, because of COVID, we didn't want to sort of have just one phone that was being passed person to person. Um, so we kind of got around that by buying lots of cheap phones from ASDA um, so that each interviewee could have a sort of separate clean phone that had only been sort of touched by somebody using gloves. Um, again, I'm sure there'll be ways around that, ways to sort of make sure things are properly disinfected and it's one of the challenges that I never thought I'd sort of be dealing with um, in terms of how to adequately disinfect a phone, but that's sort of what, where, where COVID has got us. Um, so that was um, essentially how, how we sort of got about the challenges of trying to make sure that we didn't have sort of lots of people touching um, a, a different device, including our staff. So by kind of working with our frontline staff, getting the phone logistics pinned down, um, we were actually able to, to gather some of the useful evaluation data. It, it wasn't a perfect evaluation. Um, there's still more to do. We've, we've not kind of got onto the analysis part of it yet. So it's been really helpful to hear about how other people have gone about that because um, I can foresee that that'll definitely be one of the challenges. Um, but despite all the, the kind of challenges we had getting to the point of collecting the data, we still managed to collect something um, and it's more than we would have had sort of otherwise. Um, and so now we're kind of basing the learning from that project for another bit of research that we're, we're planning this year, looking sort of at the sexual health needs of people who inject drugs. Um, we're planning to have potentially an iPad set up at a partner agency so that, again, people who would be using that service anyway and, and perhaps coming in and out of the service anyway could potentially take part in a video interview with a bit of support from staff to use the device. Um, so again, that'll just take a bit of logistics, but it seems like it, it will be possible and, and is a way to sort of get around the challenge that most of the people we're trying to engage with don't have access to digital devices or, or maybe don't have a kind of consistent phone number. Um, you know, I think when we lockdown hit, we really struggled to see a way that we would be able to still engage with people who were almost or were moving in and out of different accommodation um, and didn't have that sort of digital or phone access. But I think the key thing has just been sort of lots of planning, sort of working out all the different stages and um, working really closely with the frontline staff who are still engaging with people face to face. Um, and that's sort of given us a route in to, to try and still reach people. Um, just to kind of briefly compare that with another bit of evaluation work we've done this year, um, if I could have the next slide. So, uh, sorry, just the one before. Um, so, our HIV self-test uh, Scotland service launched in April last year, and that was a service that was specifically introduced in response to um, the pandemic because that resulted in lots of sexual health services closing. Um, so it's an at-home HIV testing service where people can kind of take uh, a 15-minute HIV test um, to find out their status. And it's a, a project that we're delivering in partnership with HIV Scotland, another um, third sector organisation. So because the service was introduced fairly rapidly in response to COVID um, with some funding and support from health boards, there was a kind of need to carry out a really quick and, and robust evaluation, um, both to potentially secure further funding to keep the service going and also to, to kind of report back to health boards on the timescales that we'd agreed. Um, so although it's not at all the way we would usually work, we kind of agreed in, in partnership with HIV Scotland that we would 
carry out the initial stages of evaluation exclusively using a survey. Um, we do use surveys, but we would always complement that with qualitative and usually peer-led um, data. But because of the time scales at play, and, and particularly in the summer, because we hadn't really worked out how best to continue delivering peer work um, remotely, we decided in this case it wasn't going to be possible. Um, we did kind of integrate multiple choice and free text questions into the survey to try and give people as much scope as possible to sort of freely share their experiences. Um, but as you would expect, the, the response rate from perhaps more marginalised communities who've been using the service wasn't as high as, as you would expect, um, which is something that's true of the service as a whole, but, but especially in evaluation, we found the people who were responding to us were sort of highly educated, um, so mostly white, mostly male sample. Um, so they were obviously kind of clear limitations there. Nevertheless, the survey did provide us with, with useful information about kind of efficacy and um, the acceptability of the service. So it, it was helpful in that regard, but it was definitely imperfect. And I don't think what, what any of us would have done if sort of face-to-face -face peer led work was an option. Um, so I, I suppose the reason I've kind of chosen to share these two examples is that neither fully reflects what we would ideally have done in normal circumstances. Um, you know, in the first case, we did have the capacity and the resources to spend quite a bit of time kind of revamping the project to work uh, in a remote setting, but that just kind of wasn't feasible in, in terms of the second case. Um, so in terms of what we've kind of learned through that process, if I could have the final slide. Um, I think the really key thing and something that I definitely found difficult as the year went on is just trying not to compare what you're doing with what would be possible in a normal environment um, because remote research and evaluation is almost always going to be imperfect by comparison um, so I've tried much more to focus on sort of comparing with having no data at all you know is what we're doing actually better than knowing nothing and in most cases sort of some form of remote um, data gathering whether it's for a research project or, or for an evaluation is going to be better than not being able to find out anything at all um, and that's certainly been true of the two bits of work that we've talked about we've not perhaps found out exactly what we would have had we been able to do the work face to face um, but we have found out something that's been helpful in terms of, of developing the service both services and, and trying to sort of move forward um, I think this has come out again of, of all the presentations so far, but particularly with peer work, doing it remotely will just require a lot more time and investment than is already in the case. Um, obviously, part of that is around training to use digital technology and to use digital technology to carry out research, which I think is in itself um, a skill. Making sure peers have access to digital devices was um, to some extent a challenge for us. So making sure that we had the budget to actually equip people with tablets if they didn't have the devices that they needed to be able to do the work remotely. Um, also, and again, this has come up already, but just the challenges of kind of supporting peer researchers when you're working remotely um, is something that I think has been a, a big bit of learning because it is a lot more difficult than when you can all just be in the room together. Um, Sort of our plan for when we'd been doing face-to-face -face interviewing was that we would be just present in the city centre so that we could help out with any issues that arose um, and obviously that wasn't sort of possible this time around so I guess it's things thinking about are you going to be on call do you do remote debriefs um, which is basically what we've done after after each of the um, sort of data gathering sessions but that's definitely a bit more tricky um, when you're not working face-to-face -face. so I think you need to give a lot more thought than might normally be the case to how you'll actually logistically manage kind of supporting the peer researchers throughout that process. Um, the final thing that I think has been a key bit of learning for us, particularly because the people we're trying to reach, I think, were particularly difficult to engage with, perhaps using digital um, approaches, is trying to work with staff, either your own staff or staff from other organisations who are still delivering services and who might still be coming into contact with people. Um, I think like Chris said, it's, it's trying to work out where people are still gathering and, and how you can still reach people there. Um, and so for us, that was via our services that because they are essential services are still operating to some extent face to face. Um, so it's obviously thinking about things like could a staff member perhaps help you distribute a paper survey or support people to fill in a survey. Um, obviously, there, there are kind of ethical issues to be worked through there about the role of staff in the research and, and how that all works. Um, so again, it's, it's imperfect, but it is something to think about. Obviously, that's bearing in mind, you know, time and capacity 
frontline staff are, are massively stretched at the moment, so that's not always going to be possible. Um, but it is worth trying to kind of think about who is still out there and who is still able to engage um, and whether there's some way you can kind of work in partnership to, to deliver your evaluation or research. Um, so just the final slide, please. Um, so that's that's me done. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or, or comments after the break. And, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks a bunch, um, Ruth. So what we will do is I did promise a small break, so I will give you one. <laughs> I am very kind in that way. Um, and then what we're going to do after the, the five minute break, we'll come back. We'll come back at about 1352 and um, have Jane's slides up. So um, give folks a five minute break and we'll, we will see you um, in five minutes. Okay, can you hear me, Sarah? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. <laughs> Brilliant. Fantastic. So Linda, what we'll yeah. do is um, we'll just again. get Jane's slides up. Right, okay, and we'll just check. So let's just check that, uh, let's do a slideshow. Some current slides and just check I'll, okay, whoops. Sorry, just go back. But I'm seeing presentations open here. Come on, that one. Right. Okay. And right slides. And just do a wee slide share. Uh, screen share. Can see that's all okay. Okay. Right. How's that there? Your screen. You see no, that? When we met earlier, I thought I didn't realise you couldn't hear me because I said a few things, and I realise now. Yes. The Super. All right. Welcome back after that short break. Hopefully you were able to run and get a biscuit. Um, we are back in action with uh, Jane Cullingworth. So without further ado, I will leave you in capable hands. All right. Well, thank you very much. I do think it's ironic, given this is a presentation about innovation in online digital methods that you couldn't hear me anyway. Um, so my name is Jane Cullingworth, and I, I want to talk to you about a project I've been involved with. Uh, we've been researching the impact of COVID on disabled people. Uh, this is a project between University of Glasgow and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, you can see my colleagues listed there. So we've been doing research both in England uh, and in Scotland. And the purpose of the, the research has been to evidence the impact of the pandemic and also to make recommendations about how to address some of the issues. Um, next slide, please, Linda. Oh, other way. Um, so what I want to talk about today is the impact of the data collection methods that we've used. Obviously, because of the pandemic, none of the research that we did was face to face. So we relied uh, on other forms. Um, so I want to talk today about the impact on the participants, the impact on us as researchers, what it's meant for the data, and also what some of the enablers and barriers have been. Uh, and also to touch on what the implications are for the future. Uh, next slide, please, Linda. So I'll just take you through the methodology. So we've been doing semi-structured interviews with disabled people and disabled people's organisations in England and Scotland. Uh, we've done the interviews in two stages. We're about to go into the second stage shortly. And we've met with people from a range of different impairment groups and across a number of different localities. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the data collection methods we used, we asked people what would work for them. Uh, mo a majority of people, we ended up using Zoom. Uh, quite a few people used phone. Uh, we did a couple of email interviews. And in one case, somebody just submitted the written answers to, to the questions. And we did offer a number of other types of platforms. Um, so, oh, and so in my case, 60%, just over 60% of people use Zoom. 30% uh, used to phone. Uh, so next slide. Oh, wait, you've already gone ahead. Okay, so one of the things that, that we found was that, that uh, sort of non-face-to-face methods actually increased access for us. So in some cases, it was about particular communities. So for some of the people we spoke to with dementia, having a different way of, of meeting was actually really helpful. So the individual I did the email interview was, was a man with dementia and that worked really well for him having time to respond to the questions and then email me back. Uh, in some cases for people with learning disabilities, it was, it was a helpful way to have the, the conversation. It of course enabled us to 
cover masses and mass ge geography uh, from cities to remote islands in Scotland and all across England. And it was easy. It was easy access to people uh, for people who used Zoom. Uh, it was a really seamless process for recording the interviews and then getting them trans transcribed. Uh, next uh, slide. But of course, not being able to meet with people really decreased the ability for us to see the context of people's lives. So we had either limited access to people's context or no access at all. So you don't have those visual clues that you that you have when you meet with someone in a home or their workplace or you know, an organization they're involved with. So harder to get a feel for a person's life. And so you don't really know what you've not missed um, uh, by, by not seeing people in their environment. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the access to and use of technology, obviously there is a digital divide. We did our recruitment through disabled people's organizations. And I have to say, uh, organizations like Glasgow Disability Alliance have done the most phenomenal job at getting digital devices out to, um, to their service users and found really great ways to help people figure out how to use those, uh, those devices. Um, but but our, who we spoke to, it did mean that people needed to be comfortable either with the online technology or, or with um, using a phone. Um, we did, what we did find was that for some, there's di different levels of comfort with technology. And in particular interviews with people with learning disabilities, uh, there were some particular issues there. Uh, so one of our research team talked about that it was much harder to, to build a rapport with somebody because you're doing it through a screen. And many of the people that uh, she spoke to were using a tablet rather than a laptop. It's, it's fiddly using Zoom. So in cases where somebody, she was speaking to someone who was with their guardian, it became, there was more reliance on the guardian um, and issues around trying to ensure consent. So we had an easy read version for people. If you were sitting with someone, you'd be able to see if they were looking at the, at the documents, be able to read their body language uh, more easily, an issue that came up in other presentations. Um, and this individual talked about, you know, typically her interviews with people with a learning disability would be sort of 45 to 60 minutes long. On Zoom, they were 20 to 25 minutes. So I think that really speaks to, you know, certainly the, you know, how, how much data, probably certainly the quantity of the data, but also kind of the, in, how in depth that, that connection was able to be. Um, next slide, please, Linda. In terms of how we connected with people, um, online using Zoom or other online platforms was definitely superior. So although you had limited context, you had some context of people's lives. So you can see that I like lots of things on my wall. You see the rest of this room, it's crazy. But so you get like a little slice of, of a person's life, but not what you would have if you were with them in person. That was much harder on the phone because you had no sense of the person's context. You couldn't see them. And email was, was the, the very least um, in terms of building rapport because it, it, it wasn't in real time. It was so disconnected. Uh, next slide. Our research team had a very interesting conversation about power and whether what the impact was on the power between the, the participant and the, the researcher. And, and many of us felt that not being face to face actually gave participants in some ways more control over the space, over the interview. Um, they, they could more easily end the interview. You weren't in their space. So it wasn't a case of, you know, if they didn't want you in their home anymore, it's not so easy to, you know, to suddenly end an interview. But the online technology or phone did, did, did give people that power. Um, and I had a very interesting uh, experience where I was interviewing somebody on Zoom. And when we started the call, the woman had her video off and I really was tempted to say to her, oh, could you just put your video on so I can see you and say hi. I'm so happy that I kind of resisted that temptation because I knew that was my need. Um, and at the end of the interview, she suddenly put her video on and shut up, oh, here I am. And in a later communication with her via email, she sort of explained it. She said, you know, I felt that I could trust you. That's why I put the video on. So it was a really interesting experience in terms of her having that control and being able to decide when she allowed me to see her. So she, she had that control. 
Uh, we talked in the team about when we were pulling together ideas for this presentation, you know, one of the researchers said, well, we all look the same on Zoom. We've all got the same amount of sort of box space. So is there a leveling of power? I mean, I think there's an argument to be made that it does change the power dynamics somewhat. I think the researcher still holds more power just by nature of what it is that you're, you're doing as a researcher, but possibly it's less threatening to participants. Uh, as we do our second round of interviews, this is actually something we're going to ask people what they how they felt about um, the, the methods that we've used. I guess the other thing to say about power is because you're not in somebody's space, you can't see who else is around. So we don't know if there's somebody else in the room when we're interviewing someone that's maybe impacting on how a person, how free a person is to speak. Um, next slide. Um, the other impact of, of the way that we did the research is that it significantly increased the capacity. So at the end of this one year project, we'll have done almost 200 interviews and that's with the equivalent of two full-time uh, equivalent research associates. We're not the only ones doing the interviews, but we've done most of them. That has, however, been an intensification of, of the work. And I think we've had less reflection time. When you travel to meet somebody, you have that time as you're going to meet with them. When you leave someone's home and you're traveling back to your, your work, you know, you've got that time just to sit on a bus or a train and sort of reflect. Whereas, you know, certainly what I found working on Zoom is that you tend to, you, you know, you're, you're sort of online all the time. And so you don't give yourself that kind of more natural reflection time. It was very easy to work across the two teams. That was certainly a, a great benefit. I'd not met any of the people in the London team. I feel like I know them really well now. It's obviously cheapest chips, right, to do to do phone and online interviews, much, much cheaper than paying for us the travel time and the, the cost of going to different places. Um, next slide. So just to wrap up in terms of future implications, I do think that this has changed the way we do research forever. There's, there's lots of arguments that being cost effective, it's at least very safe as a researcher, um, very efficient, enables great you know, team working across locations. But there's, there's just no question that, that although it was very effective in so many ways, it is just not the same as meeting someone face to face and having that personal connection. But I think there are going to be all sorts of implications. You know, what are funders going to, to, to want to see? You know, they're, they're going to get, much, there's going to be much, there, there may be a, a sort of um, a pressure on, on us to really be able to justify the costs of actually meeting face to face when it can be done so much more cheaply, um, sort of online or on the phone. So I do wonder what that's going to mean for us in terms of the kind of resource we're able to get to do interviews. As I noted earlier, it, it um, does have an implication on us as researchers as well in, ter as, in terms of the, the work intensification. And every researcher has to end a presentation saying there's more future researchers needed on this issue. Um, we're certainly seeing um, more publications coming out about uh, uh, sort of online technologies. And final slide, Linda. I just wanted to end with a quote from one of the participants. And Ashley says about the whole experience of COVID, I don't want that after this crisis is over for people to say, oh, well, actually, we don't need to make that meeting accessible because disabled people, you can Zoom it, you can WebEx it or Teams it. And I think it's important to, to, to profile the, the, this perspective um, from the people that we spoke to. And that is that technology definitely cannot be the answer to the experience of disabled people in society, that that's the way that people have to participate. But I think this also resonates for us as researchers and how we do do research that it, technology is great, but it can never replace uh, the experience of actually meeting people face to face. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shane, for that really interesting um, presentations, all all four of them um, that really started get the wheels turning for me quite a bit. Um, and I will have probably questions to follow up with uh, each of you guys sort of offline um, via email, but um, thank you so much for that. So what we're going to do now is if we can go to the next slide, um, we're going to spend about 20 minutes, bring us back at about um, uh, five, uh, 25 past. Um, 
Think about what thinking about what you've heard today. I want to give us an opportunity to share and network with one another about our own experiences in this time. And this is a relatively informal conversation. We're not going to have um, folks report back to the group. There will not be a report or any sort of summary that that I need for my grading scale or anything like that. Um, just want you to, to be able to share some of the resources with other folks that are in the room. So the, the we've got one question to focus on is sort of what have been some of the key lessons learned in your work adapting in 2020 and what might be the implications for your work this year? So I put a couple prompts down here, um, things like challenges in participatory work, like Ruth and Chris um, talked about working online with your particular population. Um, Delivering research and evaluation at speed, um, which I think, again, all of our folks talked about as well. Adaptations to your services, and then, again, things that you might be taking forward um, into next year. So, um, Linda, you can go ahead and send our little breakout group message to um, each other, and you should be getting that shortly, and then um, we should be away to our groups. There we go, and we'll be back at 1425. Thanks. Should all be popping up relatively soon. Great. Okay. Great. All right, folks, as um, we all start flooding back in, I would just want to, to ask to, for you guys to be um, put on mute if you could. And Linda, could you put up the slide with um, information about um, evaluation and fantastic. Yes. Okay. Now I have to say this every time because um, 
the third sector research forum is run by uh, Evaluation Support Scotland. So we're always looking for feedback as, as, uh, as we do. So um, we're gonna keep things open for a little while after the session, but one of the things um, we just wanted to capture via the chat function, we're not gonna do anything um, live here, is to just enter one key learning point. If you'd like, of course, this is all voluntary, um, you're taking away from the presentations or the breakout discussions. Um, and you can also talk about, you know, or really just go for it. Um, say what your next, next action might be, what support you're in, uh, you might need and, and where you might you get that support. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm hoping to follow up with folks um, later. So um, that would be really useful for us to know. And um, a, a final point is that Jane Marriott, who's on this call, um, works for the Third Sector Research Forum and she coordinates that for us. <laughs> Sector Research Forum has their annual conference this year, which will be, of course, online. Um, it will be on February 17th, and there's a really good mix of workshops, plenary sessions um, with folks from academia and from the third sector who are going to share their, their work. So what I'm going to do is right now, I'm just going to go ahead and pop in the registration link to the Third Sector Research Forum conference. You can also find information about that conference again on the 17th of February um, on the Evaluation Support Scotland website or on the Third Sector Research Forum website. We will be making these slides available along with um, the recording in the coming days. So um, keep an eye out for that. Um, but again, if you have uh, any questions for me, you can email me. Um, go to the next slide, please, Linda. Um, here's my contact information. You probably you might have seen it on um, the event by registration before anyway, but um, this is this is me um, at the University of Glasgow and then Jane Marriott um, at Evaluation Support Scotland and the Third Sector Research Forum. So um, I just wanna say thank you so much to all of our presenters. Thank you all for coming. Um, and I hope that you have learned something. I hope you found things um, useful and um, onward to 2021. We can do this. This is my pumping everyone up situation. Also, as a side note, I am American. So today is a great day for me. Uh, <laughs> so I hope you celebrate adequately as well. Um, thanks a bunch. I really appreciate you coming along. Bye-bye.